and I'm currently on the colorectal. Um, first job is elderly, last job is gastro. And I'm going to talk to you very quickly about infectious diseases before finals, um, if that's all right. So it's not the most riveting of topics, and your syllabus, I thought when I was revising this, that it's a little bit of a mishmash of everything that doesn't fit into any other category. So they just sort of throw it in one category. And a lot of these things I'm sure you're thinking, you, you know, do we actually need to know that for finals? And the answer is no, you don't need to know a lot about rebellion for the people in one for finals. But for some reason it's on the syllabus. But the ones I'm going to mainly focus on are the ones in orange, which apparently are your apt conditions. Um, I know you've already had a lecture on sepsis, but I thought I'd just quickly talk about infection, sepsis, and surgical patients. Talk about hospital acquired infections. Sorry, it's really boring. It's impossible to make it interesting, but you do have to know about it. Parrots of unknown origin, and then, of course, classic finish with a slideshow, if that's okay. It shouldn't take too long. Um, so, there you go, case to wet the outside, and that's a small baby looking for. So, um, this is based on an actual case that I did. Um, that when I was on surgical night. So you're in the <coughs> middle of a busy surgical night shift, it's always busy. You do only have one, and of course you can't get in touch with anyone who's seen us. They're all in the theatre, none of them can't, can't get in touch with them, it's just you. And you get bleeped, and it's done to come quickly, because it's always come quickly, because they always think their bay is the most important. Mr. Darcy's musing the six, and he looked really bad. So you ask her to, you know, S bar, like, in some details. She says, um, 58 year old male, he's got COPD, he's got bowel cancer, and he had an operation two days ago. It was an open right penny, um, there wasn't any complications, and that's all she, she knows. She doesn't have the notes, she doesn't know where they are, can't find the obstacle. So you, you trudge along, and these are his obs. So he's, well, you can read them, but he's hypotensive, um, pyrexial, tachycardic, respirates are alright, but sats are 85% on a two litre nasal cannula. Your an output's been maintained quite well at over 200 mils. But well, the nurse tells you that he is desaturated whenever she takes him off the oxygen and he's been using the PCAS regularly since the operation. So he looks bad on examination. <laughs> That's a medical term. And uh, he looks a bit sweaty, he's a bit drowsy, so he's sort of drifting in and out. And he's complaining a bit of pain around the wound site. You think you can hear a few crackles on his chest. And when you look at his tummy, you know, it's soft in the sense that it doesn't look hugely distended whilst he's only two days after an operation, so it's tender, looks a little bit red around the wound. And um, cars are soft. So, what are you going to do? Other than panic. What, what do you think? What do you think is going on given the title of the lecture? Yes. And where do you think? And where do you think um, it might be coming from? Yes. So surgical site. Chest. Chest. Urine. Yeah. So post-surgical patients always get. Chest infections, urine infections, or depending on what the surgery is, intraabdomen or whatever, whatever type of surgery we have, but always chest and urine, especially this guy. So he's got COPD and they're sitting ducks for getting chest infections because they're lying in bed, they're not breathing properly, they're probably not coughing as much because every time they cough it hurts their wound. So um, their lungs are just kind of there stagnating, they always get chest infections, and especially if at least desaturate whenever you take them off oxygen. Um, so, yeah, he's just always, they always get chest infections after the operation. And urine infections, because they'll get catheters put in during the operation, uh, so always going to get a urine infection as well. So that's the, the main thing you're thinking of when you go and see a sort of post-op patient when you're on surgery, chest, urine, or intra-abdo, or something like that. So, this, ooh, you can't see the top of that. But this is, um, half it's gone. Hang on, I might just do it like that so you can just see it. Um, so, this is like my sort of 10 steps uh, master plan for dealing with a septic patient. First thing is stop panicking, don't do this, and try and like, just think through it logically. Like, you all know it's septic, but when you go and see a patient and they look like that, and you're the only person there, and their muses are going up, and you do just go, oh, like, what we're going to do, and you kind of have a bit of panic. Just try and fight down the panic and just think logically. Like, you all knew what was going on. And you know that the main places, the main culprit is going to be the chest or urine. So the first thing you need to do is put him on 15 litres of non um, through non rebreathe. Now I know you all understand, like you all know that you've got to be careful with COPD patients. Obviously, you don't want him to lose his respiratory drive. But it will say hypoxia will kill before hypercapnia. 
so um, you know you need to get his oxygen up. He's, he's saturating about what did I say 85 percent I think on two liters. So you need to get that up. And what I like to do first of all is um, to do an ABG. That's like one of the first things I do when I go see a patient who you think might, might sort of go off is like, just do an ABG nice and early because it gives you a good idea of what you might be dealing with. Is it respiratory? Is it metabolic? Um, has he got a ragingly high lactate? So it just gives you more of an idea of what to play with. Um, the next thing is you get IV access, as you all know, two large book cameras. It's amazing how quickly you can say that in your OSCE, but then it's amazing how long you'll spend at point four trying to get a camera in someone who's really sick. Um, but yeah, you get access to two green cannulas in the anticubital fossa, uh, really easy. And then you take all your bloods off from the cannula, so just send it off for everything that you can think of, because at the moment you're kind of a little bit blind as to what's going on. So you want full blood count, using these LFTs, CRP, clotting, lactate, amylase for anyone who's, you know, could be an acute abdomen. Uh, yeah, and cultures. And fluids, so lots and lots and lots of fluids. So he's a young guy, I think he was like 53. 500 mils of complex, and I'm always amazed by how much fluid septic patients can get through um, and don't really show any response with their ops. It's incredible, like they get, they just, they get through so much fluid and you keep giving it to them, you're like, what, where the hell are they putting it? It's because they're just so vasodilated, they're sweaty and they're just losing like all this fluid. So just don't be afraid to give them, you know, regular fluid chances and just keep reassessing. If you think you're going to overload them, you can just slow it down. But, um, they need lots of fluid. So I think I gave him sort of three fluid challenges before he need, his blood pressure started to pick up. Like, it's amazing, I don't know where it goes. And then loads of fluid, so two hourly, four hourly, and you can always like slow it down. And keep an eye on his urine output. Um, so yeah, that's aggressive fluids. And then you need to start some sort of sensible antibiotic. So at the moment you think it's probably chest, could be urine, could be intraabdo, we don't really know at this point. Um, so you want to start on something suitable. Um, I've got a slide in a minute which sort of mentions a few antibiotics so you don't say something ludicrous in your OSCE. But um, yeah, just start on something broad spectrum. So if it's chest, maybe co-amoxicab and um, If you think it's intra-abdo, kefimet or something like that. Um, if they're over 65 and these, they always give them tazacin. Um, but it varies depending on where you are. Um, and make sure you give them, he's on regular paracetamol, which he should be in his post-op because that will bring the temperature down. And there were two more points, but uh, who knew? I can't remember what they were. Oh yeah, and then you need to sort of do your investigations. So do do all of your investigations, urine dip, chest x-ray, abdo x-ray. If there's anything to swab at the wound, do that. Um, he might end up having to have an NG um, down if you know he's vomiting and things like that, or if you think he might have an app post-op ileus. And then you can phone your senior. Now, I'm not saying that if you're worried about the patient and you think they might need escalating to HD or whatever, you can't phone them before that. It's just that it looks a lot better if you phone your senior at this point instead of phoning them at point two and saying, oh, well, I've seen this patient and, uh, yeah, put my oxygen and these results and uh, I was going to do some bloods but I wasn't really sure and should I do an ABG? Like, they just won't come and see them. But if you phone them and say, come see this patient, they're using it six, this, this is what their ops were. Um, I've done bloods, I've done cultures, they're having regular fluids. Um, I'm sending them for a chest x-ray and you're, uh, I've asked the nurses to get your dip. Is there anything else you want me to do? And they'll say, oh, well, you've done all the hard work, I'll just come see them. And I start from antibiotics. Like, they, it's, it's amazing how much quicker they'll come and see them like, if you actually have done something proactive. So let's try and, so yeah, let's try and get back to the original. So I'm sure you've all seen these things, I know they vary between trusts. So one in Leeds is um, Buffalo, um, I like to try and remember. The way I remember it for, fi for um, the finals was they all go in twos. Um, so you take blood cultures, give antibiotics, You so they're kind of the two that go together. You give a fluid challenge and you put a catheter in to make sure that you know the fluid output and input. You do a lactate measurement or an ABG and then you put them on oxygen. So go to like two by two. And um, if that looks really good in your OSCE, if you can just reel that off and you don't have to, you know, you're not going, oh, what's, what's the U of buffalo and what's this? Because in our OSCE, we had a patient with severe pneumonia and um, it was sort of like how to work it out and what was your, what's your management, what are you going to prescribe? And those are people who are like, oh, I couldn't remember like the last thing to do in a septic patient. You just don't want to be stressing about that. It's a really easy thing to do. So just like make sure you can reel off what you're going to do with the septic patient really quickly. And you've all seen this diagram. I won't blab on about it because you've had a lecture on sepsis. 
but the, the whole idea of kind of intercepting these patients early is to try and stop them at this point as opposed to letting them get onto severe sepsis and shock. So you want to kind of intercept them up the earlier down the arrow as possible. So these are just a few of the antibiotics. These are the Leeds guidelines. Um, again, they vary depending on where you work. But this is just a bit of an idea of something sensible to prescribe. Because I find that people always get a bit freaked out by prescribing antibiotics. Um, when you're all panicked and you don't know what you're doing and you're, you're asking, you don't want to just write down something really silly. You, you probably still get you know, a mark for trying, but if you say to oh, someone who I think has got pneumonia, I'm going to give them flu cops or so, then the mark would just be like, well, you probably wouldn't do that. It just shows that you don't really, you maybe haven't been on the wards as much, or you don't know what the regular types of antibiotics. Don't worry too much about the doses because you will I think you have a BNF when you're in your skin and things like that. But if it's a skin sort of infection, cellulitis, anything like that, flu clocks, these are all the IV ones, so if you give flu clocks, would be a sensible choice of antibiotic to give. If you think it's urine, you can give coamoxiclav, and then they give a stat dose of gents in some drusts. It's usually if they've got catheter in or something, or they've had catheter change, they'll give them a dose of gents. Um, if they're penicillin allergic, you give them Cipro, I think. Um, if it's severe caps, so like curb score of three, it's IV... Um, amoxicillin, comoxicillin, and chlorothromycin, and um, that's what I started this guy on. If it's intra-abdo, it's kefamet, all time, like when you're on surgery, that's all they go for. Um, so, yeah, um, if you don't really know what it is, just go for something broad spectrum. Taz is always a good bet, but um, kefamet's another good one if you don't really know. And meningitis, which you won't really be prescribing, but I think it's one of the ones that you kind of you know, it, it could be something in a slideshow, like a picture of meningococcal sepsis, you know, you, it's kept track, so, so um, yeah, that's just, so you've got a bit of an idea and you don't kind of lose your head in the OSCE. Am I right to move the slide on? So, hospital acquired infections. I'm sorry, it can't, it's just not an interesting topic, but unfortunately, this is the type of thing that will really annoy you in your OSCE when you're all prepared to kind of, deal with some, you know, a patient with sepsis or whatever, and then they say, oh, this patient's got C. diff, like, what are you going to do? And you're like, what, really? That's what you're giving me, you're asking? And it has come up before, like, it's come up in the past, so it's one thing no one ever wants to learn about because it's really boring and, and, like, you know, you don't think it'll come up, but it does because they're quite, they're quite mad keen on it. And um, oh, gosh. Well, I think all it says at the top is hospital acquired infections. Um, so C. diff, basically. Um, it's an anaerobic gram-positive spore forming bacilli. You don't need to remember any of that. All you need to know is that it forms spores which are resistant to everything aside from nuclear warfare, it would seem. So they're resistant to drying, alcohol, stomach acids, disinfectants, you name it, they can survive these spores. That's why C. diff is everyone's worst nightmare on the wards. Like, you see the nurses, if someone says, oh, if the patient's got C. diff, everyone's like, right, like, you know, they all get really like, worked up about it. Major cause of diarrhea, mainly affects older people and it's associated with antibiotic use and environmental contamination, I think that says. And that's what it looks like. I integrated microbiology, so for some reason I think it's interesting. But they're bacilli, so they're vault shaped, and that's what it looks like on an electron microgram. And these are the type of people who get C. diff. So your classic patient is an old biddy who's been in hospital for a month, some bright spots given her some third generation cephalosporin. She's had surgery a few few weeks ago, probably abdo, and she's also, you know, got loads of different comorbidities. Prolonged use of PPIs, I didn't know that one until I looked at the guidelines, but like omeprazole and lanzoprazole must increase your risk, and drugs that are, you know, suppress fertility, so you've got things that are kind of keeping your bowels more stagnant and you're not moving along, that'll increase your chance of getting C. diff. So that's the type of people who um, will get it. And it'll be something really bond or in your, in your exams. It, it'll be someone like an old person who's just been on antibiotics and then presents with diarrhea. And these are apparently the symptoms. Explosive, and apparently it is, water, watery, foul, smelling diarrhea. And they get abdominal pain and they, it's usually cramping. Occasionally they get vomiting, but that's not one of the co like common symptoms. It's usually more abdo pain and diarrhea. And it can range from sort of a mild self-limiting diarrhea, so a couple of loose stools a day, to really severe pseudomembranous colitis. Um, and you make the diagnosis by um, stool samples for testing for the toxins which are produced by the um, cilia. You're not actually looking for all the bacteria, but for the toxins that they produce. And another arrow. 
So um, basically, it, it's just to say that it ranges from sort of like loose stools right up to people who are pyrexial, have raised white cells, up to people who have like systemic compromise and might have like toxic medicone and things like that. So it can be it can be life threatening. And this is another acronym that Leeds use, um, which they did when it came. I can't remember what year it was in the OSCE, but they wanted you to say this in the OSCE. This was a few years ago. Like, maybe like two or three years ago. Um, so yeah, you should su suspect a case of C. diff in, if like, if you suspect a case of infective diarrhea if there's no other obvious cause of them having loose stools. They need to be isolated into a side room. Everyone needs to wear gloves and apron when they come into contact with them. You have to hand wash with soap and water, not alcohol, um, and test the stools for the toxins. So that's sort of the um, immediate management. And the treatment of C. diff, if it's just a mild case, you can put them on oral metronidazole, um, usually for about 10 days. If it's more severe, you can give them vancomycin, again, orally. If it's complicated or they've got pseudomembranous, you can give them vanc plus IV metronidazole. And then you, you should always basically try and use oral with C. diff infection because you want the drugs to sort of pass through the site of the infection. So it's, it's better, for it, it's more effective for it to go oral. But if for whatever reason you can't, Give, it to, give them um, oral antibiotics if they're vomiting a lot, if they're sort of not nil by mouth or they're not really conscious and they don't have a safe swallow or whatever, then you can give it IV, but you usually have to speak to microbiology. And, um, and that even if they've got a lot of systemic compromise, you might want to give it IV. Um, and you all know about prescribing IV vancomycin. If you've seen the charts, which they like to bring out, these ones in these. I'm not going to go through it with it because I think you have like a paperwork lecture one of these that are near to your exams. Make sure at some point before your OSCE, have a look at these charts. In the, they've got them um, in like Jimmy's and LGI. Um, it's basically, it's just a, how to prescribe IV vancomycin. And it's really straightforward and explains it really clearly in here. But if the first time you see it is in your OSCE, it'll look pretty bad because it can be quite confusing. You basically have to use yeah. this kind of like um, sort of formula. Does anyone know? Has anyone ever seen these, or am I just? Yeah. So you basically have to use this formula on the back to um, work out their creatinine clearance, and then work out what dose to give them. Um, and it's all really easy to follow, but it'll be really obvious if you go and go. Uh, I don't know what to do. Like they'll just know you've not been on the board, and you've not been going into placement. So I would recommend like just grab grabbing one of these or getting someone who's on placement and needs to have a look at it. So if you have a normal renal function, you, you, if you have a normal renal function, it's like it's the same for everyone basically. It's just if you have a compromised renal function. What that, the I the back? Yeah. No, no, no. You work out for everyone you're putting on IV vancomycin. Okay. So you basically need to you. It's it's this weird kind of calculation. It's like 140 minus the age of the patient times how much they weigh divided by their creatinine clearance. You don't need to know it, like you do not need to know it off by heart, so don't write this down because it's on here. And then you times it by some factor depending on whether they're male or female. It doesn't matter what their renal function is. If the renal function is really, really poor, um, it just means that you'll probably put them on like the lowest dose of vancomycin you can do because it can be quite nephrotoxic. But you need to know what their creatinine clearance is before you prescribe it. And is and it the same sort of thing as for gentamicin? Gentamicin is similar, um, but slightly different. You don't really, I, I never actually saw anyone, I've never actually seen anyone on long-term gentamicin. The only time I ever see it used is for like a stat dose if you're changing a catheter. In, um, but in, a, they in use G's, a different trust. In G's with the GI, they Kinders, use amoxicillin. Yeah. 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 I, it's not, it's well, it's, I don't think it's ever come up in, as in, having to know it for the OSCE, but I think it's worth learning it. They've got a graph, haven't they? And you kind of put it on the yeah. graph. It's a similar type of thing to okay. this. And then you kind of adjust the dose thing depending on what the using ease and things are doing. So yeah, it is similar, I think. But I've never had to do it. I remember briefly reading about it for five years, though. Um, okay. So, MRSA. Um, it's basically staph aureus that's developed resistance to lots of antibiotics that we use. It's usually found on the skin of healthy people. About a third of healthy individuals carry MRSA on the skin, usually in the axilla, groin, or in the nose. Um, and it can cause infections when it gets into the wrong places, and that's basically during it, um, like during operations. If you get if you get bacteremia, or if you're putting a cannula in and you don't do it aseptically, you can give someone an MRSA infection. 
Um, and again, it ranges from very minor ailments like sort of boils and pimples and things like that to really severe bacteremias and very severe MRSA pneumonias that are difficult to treat. Um, spread by skin to skin contact and indirectly through inanimate objects, which I always think sounds a bit weird, but it just means like door handles and surfaces and things like that. And that's what it looks like. So, it's a Staphylococcus, uh, which means that it's a bunch, like a bunch of grapes. So, it, they're all bunched together, and um, cocci means it's round. If it's Streptococcus, they're in chains. And if it's Diplococci, they're in chains. That's a Staphylococcus. And oh, that's enough, that's enough my okay. <laughs> Treatment of patients um, with MRSA. If they're just colonised, then you need to just give them decol. Um, I was going to bring a form with me, but I forgot. There's like a different prescription chart, if you've seen it, for like decolonisation for MRSA. You basically give them chlorhexidine, which is like hippie scrub stuff, for five days, and mupirocin nasal ointment for five days. Um, and that's meant to be like to eradicate their MRSA. If you suspect that they've got an infection secondary to MRSA, um, that would be a pretty good diagnosis, but you probably need to speak to microbiology, and they usually put them on, again, vancomycin, um, as per the chart, or something like linezolid and things like that. They don't often use linezolid here, but I know they use it in Harrogate. Um, so yeah, you, you, you tell them microbiology and things like that. But that's basically what you do for MRSA. It's not really that complicated. So, I thought I'd talk briefly about paratyp and their origin. And I know what you're all thinking, of course this dog's got a temperature because he's wearing a sweater and a hat and is carrying a hot water bottle so he's going to temperature. But anyway, um, paraxia of known origin, it's one of those weird things but the, the actual definition for it is a persistent temperature of above 38.3 for more than three weeks. Um, and despite having done most of the usual investigations you do, you can't find any cause for it. And um, it does happen every now and again. We had a patient who... Um, had it, we just couldn't find where the hell this infection was coming from. Um, so assuming that you've done all your routine bloods and your dips and chest x-ray and you haven't come up with anything, these are the other things you need to think of. And I really don't think you need to know it in loads and loads of detail. It's just if you sort of, it, you know, it's, it's just to get you thinking outside the box a bit about other things that could cause temperatures that might, you might not necessarily first think of. So infections, things like abscess, subphrenic abscesses or liver abscesses and things like that. Um, rheumatic fever, um, granulomas or granulomatous diseases, other weird parasites and things that can like lodge in your lungs or, spleen, um, lungs or liver and things like that. HIV, TB can also sort of masquerade as a pyrexia and you don't know where it's coming from. Um, and I would say anyone who's got a pyrexia and has got a temperature and you're not sure would do a HIV test on them because that can cause all sorts of weird and wonderful um, infections. Um, tumours, so lymphoma, malignancy, um, other things like drugs might cause infections. Crohn's all you see, but I would imagine that they'd have other symptoms and you'd probably diagnose it before, so I think it's a bit of a weird one. Sarcoid, because sarcoid causes everything, and you never have problems with it. Um, then connective tissue diseases, so rheumatoid arthritis. I think PR is polymyalgia rheumatica, I think there, which is associated with Yes. And what do you treat it with? Temporal fibers. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Stills disease, anyone know anything about that? Juvenile. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely don't need to know this virus. It's just all this weird <laughs> stuff people learn and then immediately forget. Yeah, it's, like, it's meant to have like a triad of like arthralgia, <laughs> persistent temperature, and a salmon coloured rash. Um, you'll never you'll never see it. It's just silly. Giant cell arteritis, SLE. Um, Polyarthritis nodosa, which is one of those vasculitic, medium-sized vessel vasculitis things. And Kawasaki's, I don't know a sign that you might see. They wouldn't show you your osculitis. Yeah. Yeah, strawberry tongue, yeah, I remember learning that. It's all silly, all silly stuff. Um, did someone ask me something there? Okay, so, yeah, basically your parents are unknown origin. Your parents one of your act-on conditions. I think they just want you to be able to suggest something sensible if you've got a pyrexia and you've done all of your preliminary investigations. You basically go back, you retake the history with a fine tooth comb, you want to know all of the details about their life, you thoroughly examine them, and you have to think about doing other investigations. You probably do a lumbar puncture, they probably have sort of more radiology um, or more imaging, and you think of things like serology, you're looking for like anchor and you know, things like that, other vasculitic things. 
And sometimes if they really can't find it and they just don't know what's doing, they sometimes just start them on treatment in the hope that it will kind of improve. So I, you can find me like, yeah, we didn't know what's happening, so they just start them on steroids and they got better, so it's okay. Like, you know, or they'll just start them on antibiotics and try and see. So it's a bit of like a trial to see if they just get better. So yeah, they just want you to kind of say something sensible if you're not really sure where it's coming from. And it does occasionally happen if you know. Like I've seen a couple of patients where we never really got to the bottom of what was causing the temperature, they just kind of resolved. So, oh, what's the slide for already? So mine's um, quite easy. Like, I find the closer you get to finals, the more ridiculous your slide will get. I don't know if you practice them with your friends, but you'll just be like trying to catch them out and put ridiculous things in them. Um, but this is relatively basic, and I, I didn't think, I know the girls before said that they thought it was bad, I didn't think it was that bad for us. So there's, a few, there's always a few curveballs in there, but you know, don't freak out too much. So this is all the same person. What's he got? Like, what do you think A is? Yep, B. Yep, C. PCP. D. Yep, does anyone know what it is? Toxoplasma, yeah, called I can cause brain abscesses. This one? Yeah, and that one? It's yeah. A, yeah, someone said it. Um, and do you know what it's caused by? It's mozzarella pizza sign on your... It's a silly sign, isn't it? What's it? It's, a, it's an infection in your eye. Yeah, do you know what it's um, caused by? It's CMV? Yeah, CMV retinitis. They can cause that. Um, so yeah, that's another one of those things in age of finding illnesses. Um, yeah, I, was, I did have a picture of separate dermatitis, which I recently learned is also one of those things that if someone has it, they should be. Should be. <laughs> so, yeah. This is the same patient. What's wrong with them? Bella. On a meeting, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, coughing. Yeah, coughing spots. Um, and generic rash that might be measles. I think it is measles. So, it's paramyxovirus. No one knows what it is. Um, Transmitted by droplets, they basically just get a general malaise, not really anything specific. Covered spots are meant to look like a grain of sand, or rice, or whatever it's says. A grain of salt, even. Yeah, it could work salt. Um, obviously, the lower muscle And it's just supportive treatment, really. There's not any sort of like specific treatment you give them. And you see this slight increase in the cases, sort of like a lag effect from people not having the MR, um, MR, MMR vaccine a few years ago. but. Again, it's still rare, and I really don't think you need to spend loads of time learning about it. I think the only time we could have possibly be in like a slideshow or something. Um, but I remember learning this again for fun. I was like, you can get post infective encephalomyelitis and subacute um, sub sclerosis and panencephalitis, um, which um, it happens about 10 years after the infection. You sometimes see children presenting with it if they've had it as a, a toddler. It's just another. This is all the same patient. What they got? Or what they stand for today? I can't pronounce this one. Yeah, a few people are saying, yeah. Do you anyone know what these, well A and B, that's just another generic rash, but these two? No. A is meant to be, I can't remember how to pronounce it, four child spots, which is another one of those odd things. It's not diagnostic of rubella, but people with rubella can be, you can also get it. But it's basically like hemorrhagic fatigue eye on you. Um, palette of the mouth, and these are called like blueberry muffin rash. <laughs> blueberry muffin rash, that's it, yeah. Which apparently is another thing that you get with rubella, and then a rash. So it's uncommon again, so you're obviously vaccinated against it in the end with the MMR vaccine. They get again non specific symptoms, but they get more cervical lymphadenopathy and a rash that typically begins on the face and spreads elsewhere to the trunk, arms, and legs. They can get a splenomegalus associated with it, and it's usually supportive treatment. Um, again, not a specific treatment. This one? Oh, um, yeah. Heidi Johnny squad, please. Uh, oh, I can't. No, malaria. Oh, with a I think it's called the signet ring sign, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Basically, if you get shown anything in your slideshow that's within a blood cell like that, it's, it's going to be malaria. It's the intracellular parasite that anyone can think of. Um, so yeah, it's malaria, and I think it's called a signet ring sign. So there, are, uh, and I've gone into lots of detail about malaria, but you, 
you, there are four types, but the main one is Plasmodium falciparum, which is the most common and the most deadly. Um, it's transmitted by mosquitoes, and the sporozoites travel in the saliva of the mosquito. They go around into the bloodstream and um, go into the liver where they mature, release into the bloodstream, release cytokines, and that's how where you get your symptoms of sort of rivals, really high temperatures, they get sweats, they might be jaundice, um, they might become anemic, and they generally feel a bit crap. And the treatment is always quinine, basically, and um, you give them an IV. Is that, is that even if you don't know what species, like if you don't know what yeah, type? Yeah, I think so. Like, yeah, you quinine. You can give chlor chlor chloroquinine, yeah, things like that. So, it doesn't, so it doesn't matter? Just no, and it, it will probably be plasmodium false on The other ones like Vivax and all those weird ones are quite specific to certain regions. Right, um, okay. So I think, like, I don't know what the percentages are, but most cases are going to be this one. So yeah, it would just be quinine. Mm -hmm. That's it. It was really quick. Sorry, I forgot what it was. Um, so yeah. Let's just stop talking the infectious disease you might have neglected in your vision because they're relatively dull. I uh, hope it wasn't too boring. Good luck. And yeah, you'll all be fine. And I know everyone who tell, like I tell every fifth year I come across this, don't get bogged down revising all the stupid things the finals that everyone's revising because it's really quite straightforward. And I know everyone says that too. But you'll all end up revising really ludicrous things and um, it's not that hard. Okay. That's okay. Bye. Did I switch it on? Oh, oh, how do I do it? <laughs>